Hello, hello. In the asymmetrical horror sphere, players seem obsessed with what the best builds are, strongest perks, and the game's balance. But not often enough do we focus on the horror element itself. I have discussed horror in the past, specifically regarding Dead by Daylight, with a lot of focus on defining horror. Today we're going to come at this from a different angle, looking at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game. We'll be discussing the diminishment of fear, and how pace can affect a player's immersion. To do this, we're first going to discuss the relationship between fear and learning, the concept of uncertainty and its importance to the genre. We'll analyse the structure and pacing of TCM now that the game's meta has settled, reflect on its party game genre, and suggest changes which could help improve its horror aesthetic. So let's start with the concept of... Fear is the most natural and common emotion that humankind experiences. The most common and general threats which a humankind confronts are fears related to death. Although fear is often thought of as a negative emotion, there is an element of thrill to it, as it produces adrenaline when triggered. This is partially why the entertainment industry has adopted it and the horror genre itself has remained one of the most profitable in both movies and video games. A paper on the topic of why horror is so seductive to an audience suggests, We are attracted to horrifying entertainment because we have an adaptive tendency to find pleasure in make-believe that allows us to experience negative emotions at a high level of intensity within a safe context. So we seek out strong stimuli and adrenaline-inducing situations as a source of entertainment, so long as we feel safe doing so, such as watching a movie. And video games provide the perfect immersive environment for us to embrace this emotional state. Horror games in particular allow us to feel tense and in danger while sitting in a comfortable seat with the ability to pause and step away whenever we wish. And this brings us to the asymmetrical horror genre. In a lot of my previous videos there is one word that often comes up, and this video will be no different. It is one of the most important elements to any game, especially under the horror genre. Uncertainty is a challenging element to game design which derives from the curiosity model, which suggests it is a person's tolerance for gaps of information which drives them forward. What this means is that it is our own curiosity of the unknown which pushes us to research a topic, learn a new skill, or perhaps explore a dangerous situation in a video game. Do you freeze in fear, not wanting to move forwards, or do you push on towards the locked door to escape Leatherface's basement? And this idea of uncertainty has proven to be a powerful tool in horror and games. In a paper looking at the effect of uncertainty on learning in game-like environments, it suggests that uncertain events can help motivate individuals and enact the release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter which is associated with reward-seeking behaviour. This, to me, is what makes games like Dead by Daylight, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game, and other games in the genre work so well. You never know what is going to happen, what kind of killer you might be facing, what perks are on the table, what loops, pallets, crawl spaces, obstacles, vaults, and so on are available. The adrenaline and excitement that can occur when you've almost finished that generator and a killer comes lurching around the corner with tinkerers. Or unlocking the house's front door only for a member of the family to burst through it before catching you in the act. In another paper named Changing Fear, the Neurocircuitry of Emotion Regulation, they examine four different types of regulatory processes for fear. These are extinction, cognitive emotion regulation, active coping, and reconsolidation. For the purpose of this video, we'll only be focusing on extinction, but the paper is an interesting read. Extinction is when fear is diminished through learning that a previously threatening stimulus no longer signals danger. Essentially, it's when we replace a predicted dangerous outcome with an increased sense of safety so an uncertain event starts to become far more certain. So to link this back to our topic, if we have a perceivably dangerous outcome, for example, death in a video game, this can elicit a fear response, thus driving adrenaline and pleasure within a safe virtual environment. But when this is replaced with a feeling of safety, the levels of fear will diminish, producing less uncertainty and less adrenaline, leaving only one other clear source of dopamine, a victory state, by which I mean competitiveness, which we'll discuss more later on. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise is a horror staple, and the game does a fantastic job of recreating the environments, characters, and generating a cinematic feeling like the original 1974 film. But it is a game at the end of the day, and a game has rules, rules which can be learnt. 
Extinction is when fear is diminished through learning that a previously threatening stimulus no longer signals danger. So, let's review the pacing of the early stage of a match in TCM. The pacing of TCM has rapidly evolved and adapted over the course of its first month of release. When the game was in its technical test phase and its first week of full release, the game had a very tense atmosphere, especially for the victim's side. You need only see my initial thoughts in my first TCM video reflecting on the technical test itself. But players quickly learnt the game and its rules, leading to a very different experience now, at least in my case. Rather than a cautious journey out of Leatherface's basement, victims now make as much noise as they can in the very first moments of a match. As of now, it could be suggested to be the optimal way to play. It increases the level of uncertainty of a door having been opened for the family, applying pressure on them. It places further pressure on the upstairs family members to get their setup complete as soon as possible. Whilst Leatherface has all of his obstacles still up, so is unable to do much about the noise as well in the basement, there isn't really much of a downside to the victim role. Now it's worth noting the role I have probably played the most is Leatherface, so I have experienced this first hand, but usually, within the first minute or two, Grandpa is awake, a door is opened, and Leland is on his second or third stun on poor Leatherface. Maybe they're already at the gas station side door, teabagging. So why is this? Well, there is multiple factors we need to consider, but I'll try to keep it simple. We'll look at the victim's abilities, Leatherface's capabilities, and the level design itself. So in terms of victims, the two main offenders are probably Leland and Anna. Anna can use her Pain is Nothing ability to significantly reduce damage received when in a tight spot, making her difficult to kill. Leland, in a similar vein, has Lifesaver, allowing him to shoulder barge a family member, stunning them for a time in an emergency. This again, making him feel pretty safe, especially in the early game. In combination with their high toughness and strength stats, can set them up as comfortable choices to tackle any one family member, especially a Leatherface at the beginnings of a match. Then we need to look at Leatherface, the destructive monster of the family, and a necessary component for a team to be able to play. He is able to deliver high damage, destroy doors, obstacles, crawl spaces, and push his chainsaw through wall gaps. The basement is his domain, and all of these abilities make him feel shockingly weak there. On the surface, Leatherface is fine, but after you've been backstabbed, shoulder barged, stun locked in a door, and teabagged through a wall gap enough times, you realise Leatherface has maybe lost his mojo. But you gotta have mojo, baby, yeah! And that brings me to the level design. The basement is the safest space for victims to go, and that does make sense, they need somewhere to be able to retreat to. But in the early stages, when it's a 4v1, the Leatherface experience is quite miserable at times. This is supported by the large number of players who are opting to dodge lobbies where they have no choice but to play him, and I can't really blame them. It can feel rough, and it breaks your immersion as Leatherface to see him stumbling up having been knocked to the ground by Sonny slamming a door into his face several times in a row. So I would suggest that the early game pace feels off. Victims rush out of the doors, confident in knowing Leatherface cannot really do anything to stop them, nor defend himself. So rather than immersing themselves in a well-crafted horror environment, why are players opting to rush a win in a so-called party game? Gun media seem to hold on to this idea that TCM is a party game. The game's supposed to be fun, the game's not supposed to be competitive, right? Like, that's not the point of the game. The, the point of the game is get in and, and, and have a blast and feel like you're living in the world of, of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's the point. But I think it's unavoidable. Regardless of the desires of the development team, they have an online game where two sides compete. Ultimately, people are going to get sweaty. What we don't lean into is the competitive side of it because it starts to breed a different type of player. It's not one that's right or wrong. It's they, it, it's, it, it skews off of friendship sometimes. It starts to create a different atmosphere that doesn't fit into what I think the game's supposed to be or even the IP itself. And it's not their fault. The game's design can facilitate whatever environment they want, but the self-esteem and ego of gamers is also a factor. It's difficult to find a solid numerical value for the percentage of people who struggle with self-esteem, but there is countless studies and articles that suggest, as a society, we have a problem with our own self-images. But why does this matter? A paper by Franken and Brown suggests that those who tend to suffer with a lower self-esteem, have poorer coping skills, tend to view the world as a more hostile place, 
and are more likely to have a strong desire to win, whereas others might focus on performing well or experiencing a challenge. If you have an environment where someone can win and someone can lose, those with low self-esteem are going to try their very best to feel that dopamine hit of a win. This brings me to Bartel, who in 1996 developed a theory of player categories. This broke players into four types. Though, it is worth noting that this was never intended to be a general typology of all players, although it does tend to be used as one anyway. The four categories are Achievers, Explorers, Socializers, and Killers. A player can fit into more than one of these categories, but generally tends to connect with one more strongly than the others. Achievers regard points gathering and rising in levels as their main goal. Also, their point of playing is to master the game. Achievers tend to be quite competitive. They look to get a high score and win. This might be a Leland farming points stabbing the family members. They tend to play fairly because it's about the skill for them. It is suggested they make up about 10% of all players. Another 10% of players are explorers. They delight in having the game expose its internal machinations to them. So for example, finding bugs, finding the strongest tactics, or working out the best builds in the skill tree. Socializers like interacting with other players. They like talking, being part of a group, and helping others. These are the majority of players, making up roughly 80% and other casual players having fun with their friends, or playing with new people and working together. Finally, there is the killer players. Suggested to make up less than 1% of players, they get their kicks from imposing themselves on others. Winning isn't enough, they want others to lose. Highly competitive and revel in someone else's defeat. I personally think asymmetrical horror games attract more of this category than other games I've played. These are the exploit abusers, using the door stun to keep a family member stuck, or those who will wait at an exit point feeling a strange need to be seen leaving. Still a minority of the player base, but more prominent than perhaps in other games. It's worth noting though, most players are socialisers, but maybe you exhibit more killer traits than you'd like to admit, looking at you victim players. So what this leaves us with is potentially a player base who is more competitive than what the developers would hope, and an early game which is more optimally played to rush and beat down Leatherface if he dares to try and get in your path. But is there anything that could be done to adjust this? So to recap, the elements I really want to protect and encourage are the elements of fear for the victim player's experience, and establish a greater sense of uncertainty. The trouble is, I don't ever want to make suggestions that require huge overhauls to the game design or given mechanics. Also, it's worth noting that the September 12th, 2023 update has made attempts to improve the current early game pacing issues. These include, the car battery will now start out on and be powered up by default, and bone scrap piles are now limited to three uses per pile. This should allow ground floor family members more time to prepare their defenses, and Leatherface should experience less frequent backstabs. At least in theory, you're at least less likely to watch Leland getting bone scrap after bone scrap during your stun animation. But these are not perfect solutions, so I have some ideas which could support the early game atmosphere and improve Leatherface's monstrous vibe. My first suggestion, I'm sure will be deeply unpopular among victim players, but I would like to see victims start with far less health, maybe 20%. I know, I can sense your anger, but hear me out. Narratively, the victims act injured, and likely they weren't treated politely as they were carried to the basement, so it would make sense narratively. Also, it would encourage victims not to make tons of noise, because if you wake grandpa and another family member comes running down to the basement early on, if you have fellow victims still at low HP, that's potentially one less distraction you have later in that round. It also gives victims another initial objective. There's plenty of health bottles planted around the environment to utilise, and victims would be encouraged to seek out and heal each other, thus further slowing the pace. And with less initial health, victims are going to be even less keen to get on Leatherface's radar, as now his initial threat level is automatically increased. In terms of knocking Leatherface over with doors, I'm sure it's a matter of balance to have him able to be stunned for a time, and there should be a reward for a well-timed door slam for victims. But, I think Leatherface, rather than falling to the ground, should stay standing. Be stunned, but the door should break upon impact. This would fix the early game door stun lock, and make Leatherface feel more intimidating again. I would also make Leatherface build resilience to stuns. The more you stun him, the less impact they deliver, until eventually nothing. This would increase the level of uncertainty later in the game. Leland might not be so confident taking on Leatherface if he is unsure how much resilience he has built up. This would also encourage early game Leatherface avoidance, which I think would feel much better for all parties involved. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre game excels when it's tense, and victims are fueled by fear. I believe the game needs to focus on retaining that horror aspect 
to avoid falling victim to the competitive crowd, who will exploit patterns to create a repetitive meta. To do this, without much adjustment to the game's core mechanics, I would seek to slow the early game pace further, and make Leatherface the threat he is in the original 1974 movie. I believe this might encourage more people to embrace playing him, if he starts as something to fear, and can build into an unstoppable beast with every stun inflicted upon him. I think these changes, in combination with those that arrived on the September 12th patch, would resolve a lot of the early game issues I have. But those are my thoughts. But what do you think? Does TCM still scare you? Do you have any other suggestions to adjust the pace? Or do you think I'm totally wrong? Let me know why in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching the video, have a great day, and I really hope Crossplay comes back for us PC players soon.